Hello and welcome to the Universal Blueprint channel where we're looking at various sources of um, spirituality, symbology and the, the deepest meaning of the um, constructs that have built our uh, conscious civilization in modern time. And it's quite an important study and um, as you no doubt have seen if you see my other videos we're looking at a full range of um, subjects really and trying to apply the Universal Blueprint to those um, context we look at things like the history uh, different religions different cultures different practices different uh, occultisms different scientific uh, studies and the root behind all of this because at the end of the day no matter what we're looking at everything is built upon the um, construct of the human mind and the whole human minds are uh, linked together in terms of how they operate and in, uh, and each mind itself also is a fabrication of the universe because it all studies parts of the universe so the same systematic properties are uh, continuous throughout and that's what the universal blueprint is it's trying to find the core root of how things are created and understood and one of the topics we discussed in our last video was the use of the pentagram and how the pentagram is uh, commonly misconceived in different ways in different rituals and cultures um, but we also went back and looked at the root reasons for its um, use and creation and it, why it forms part of the society we have today whether we like it or not and another uh, so off the back of that, because it was quite a successful video, and people seem to um, want to talk about that quite a lot, uh, I'm going to move on with another one, which is the cross. Now, the cross is extremely interesting because it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people each time different. But equally, it can also be very controversial talking about the idea of the cross, which may seem strange, which may seem strange to some uh, listeners because. Um, you know, like I say, it means different things to different people. Very religious people will be to see it as the Christian cross and have very um, kind of set beliefs about it. But uh, what I want to do today is instead of go through, um, because again, it's just like the pentagram, it's very much misconstrued in its use and um, ideology. Um, so rather than kind of untangle all that, which was a comment in my last video, um, where we, we can spend hours kind of um, dissecting uh, the root causes of why it's misconceived but what we could do because that's in you know there's so much written context about that subject already you can pick up a um, hundred different occultist books or um, spirituality books that do that already um, I want to just kind of put that to one side and actually just explain the root origin of the symbol and what it really means rather than untangle everything we just go back to the beginning we identify the true use of it or the original use of it in its um, most basic form and then we go and build on that in reverse that's how you um, kind of untangle this properly instead of working backwards you go to the root and then you build up from it and see how it was um, portrayed in the way it is today so that's what we're going to do now so this could be quite a controversial topic for most people but equally it should be very enlightening um, and it should uh, kind of open a lot of doorways for people in all areas because one thing I do realize is that even um, modern day occultists um, don't actually really understand the use of the cross or what it's really meant for um, some of them do some of them don't and um, a lot of the people I've spoken to don't really see it in the way that I'm going to portray it today so hopefully no matter who you are what system you study or how you see the cross hopefully you'll take something away from this video today um, and that's the general premise of what we're trying to do here um, so the cross itself let's go right back to the beginning um, especially in the Western culture obviously the cross is a symbolic icon uh, represented in various different religions and cultures but actually when we look at it it's actually in every religion and culture because it's more than this icon it's a the actual cross itself or a cross is so simple and so um, basic that actually it forms the very root of our physical existence today and that's the true meaning of the cross so let's go back to that and to go right back to basics we have to look at mathematics and the actual use of a cross 
Now this is brought to light in um, one of the studies uh, within the book of Toth, for example, by Alistair Crowley, who goes through this quite well. And it's also built on from that because it's it's a root in Egyptian culture. It's a, it's a root in shamanism that was you know four thousand six thousand years um, BC, and it was used in this way at that time, but described in a different fashion. Now, when we look mathematically at a cross, the cross is a description of four singular points in any given space. Now we saw with the pentagram that this was a concept of five given points in any given space, which is a progression of the um, cross, or the box, or the square, which is what we're looking at today. So actually we're going backwards in our studies, um, it technically. So the, the four points represent, it's any four given points. If the best way I describe this is if you have a blank piece of paper, if you draw four points on there, then what you get is a way of measuring space. Now, because you have four points that are effectively can draw across, you divide them up into opposite sides. So you, you take the two any given points and you draw lines between them, and that gives you a box with a cross in the center. Um, it's similar to a star, it's just the way that happens. It doesn't matter where you put the four points, there'll be some form of shape of a four sided shape with a cross in the center. Nice and easy. And what this represents mathematically is a three dimensional space which is the kind of addition to a plane, which is a triangle, which we'll look at in another video. Um, and the, four dimen uh, the three dimensional space is represented by this box with a cross. On. And that's what it is. It's the measurement or the perceived reality of physical space around us, because all things around us are um, physical matter, effectively. It's atomic levels that vibrate at a certain frequency, allowing things not to pass through them, but create shapes and structures that um, obviously adhere to things like gravity and other physics. And it's the most common aspect of the mind. It's what we kind of measure things upon. We don't see energy. We see matter. We see physical shape and how it changes by the effect of matter. So if we build a wall, over time we see the wall fall down, and that's a physical structure affected by things like um, weathering and gravity and um, erosion of time, and that is the effect of energy on matter. So whether we like it or not, in this physical reality, we are a slave to um, the third, uh, third dimensional space. And it's how we measure everything, unfortunately. And what we have are, uh, when we look at the mathematical equation for this, we see built upon from the other previous steps, is um, two sets of two opposing forces to create some sort of graph or measurement between. So when we look at maths and we use the x and y axis, um, that's what we're using. We're using that to plot a physical reality or space. And we can apply this to different um, levels of reality. Uh, such as obviously the human body, the world around us, any given physical shape or box. Um, and yeah, that, that's it really. Because of the way physics work, everything is measured in this square um, concept, even a sphere. Okay, when we look at spheres, for example, we call it in Freemasonry the squaring of the circle because everything in um, actually in natural order of things, nothing is a straight line, but when we make it, uh, ourselves with our own hands, everything tends to be um, kind of an attempt to create a straight line, a straight wall, a straight, um, you know, a way away from gravity. But when natural things occur, we very rarely get straight actual lines, it's usually curves. And so when we look at physical space, we try and identify all kind of circular objects and we put it in a mental square or a box to create the planes of the dimension. So when we're looking at the physical reality of things, we have a set cross or square, but then we put it on different planes to create a box. Okay, so each plane has a, um, we call it sagittal plane, the frontal plane and the transverse plane, and you've obviously got um, de depth and height as well. But what happens here is that um, we create a box or a an object, um, but we can then put other objects inside to measure the, um, uh, the, the space inside. So we can use that to measure the um, size or the density of um, any given object. 
So it doesn't matter if it's a car, we can put four, we can put uh, six sides on it, four sides obviously being around the outside, then you have a top and a bottom. And from that, our brain can identify positions within that object that relate to one another, creating the idea of space and a physical form. And that's just the same with anything. You can put literally any any object into um, this this template. And that's what the cross is. The cross represents one plane of this, be it the frontal plane, the sagittal plane, or the transverse plane, it can all be applied. And we'll go to that in a minute in another um, description, but it's what we use to create everything physical in the world around us, just as so the universe does also in um, more spherical or curved uh, natures. And so when we look at these um, constructs, so the very basic one is the idea of all things have then four directions or four relational points to one another and this is a very obvious fact in maps when we look at when we're trying to plan a location on the planet we have um, you know north south east and west and therefore coordinates and we can plan um, on a any spatial context a certain position or pinpoint location um, and that is just part of reality that's how we've always measured things um, so you know when we start looking at for example navigation sailing it's all to do with pinpointing the position um, on the earth in relation to um, the sun and that creates for example you have your longitude latitude and then you have your spatial because the time uh, the position of the sun according to the rotation around the solar system gives us our direction which is so then you have the sun and the earth are two points so you have another two lines within that so um, there are your four points of reference which again is the number four and we see this all the time then in culture so again we go over to the eastern side of things and when we're looking at for example the, the, looking at the stars and the solar system that too is a physical reality on a much larger level and so we divide the heavens or what we can see from earth into four equal stages north east south and west which each have a um, 90 degree arc um, within the skies depending what we're looking at and what's in that arc we look at dictates which part of that reference of the sky we're, we're in at this point of the solar system it cycle because we use the stars as a chart and they use four pinpoints again so they have the um the dragon uh, they have the man they have the um phoenix um and the, the bird as well um, another stalk i believe um and so they have the four uh, sorry, that's the tiger, it's my mistake. So the man, the tiger, the phoenix, um, and the dragon, those are the four directions that the, um, the Taoists use to kind of um, pinpoint anything. So all things physical have a north, east, south, and west, effectively. The labels are always different. And this brings us back then to the cross, because the cross can be drawn in two ways, you see. So it can be drawn north, south, east, and west, or it can be drawn... For example, northeast to um, southwest, kind of transversely. But it's the same concept, it's just kind of rotated at a 45 degree angle so that you can then point eight directions within the, um, within the four. And we'll look at that later because it actually creates the eighth point, the eighth ma ma mathematical position of the, um, the octagon, or the octogram which is less well used in the occultism, but actually is a very important part of the construct. But the cross itself, we're taught in Gnosis, for example, represents the church, or the kingdom, specifically. And the kingdom is its a multi-symbolic word, which actually means... So the Christians would say the kingdom is like the heaven, the universe. Whereas, for example, the Gnosis believe that the kingdom of a church or, or that construct is actually within the body. And both are true, because north, east, south and west represent physical points on any given structure. So when we look at the world, be it the Earth or the solar system, it can be mapped out in four directional points. When we look at the planet, same, north, east, south and west. When we look at a building, for example, a church, there is a north part of a building, the south part of a building, the east and the west. And that's why you have the naves, for example, and the cloisters. 
the Eastern Chapel. And then we look at the human being, and as Da Vinci wants through, you know, we have north, east, south, and west on the human body. North being the head, south being the feet, east and west being the two sides of the shoulders or the hips, depending where you look at it. And then we have the front and the back. And so these are all scaled down representations. This is what we call the cosmic levels, the microcosm of the body and the macrocosm of the solar system or the, the world around us. It's very important, but each one can represent everything. So when we talk about the north of the kingdom, we could be talking about the head, we could be talking about the north pole, or we could be talking about the heavens um, and you know the higher levels of consciousness. So it works... Because also we have to remember that the mind is a psychological construct of a physical form also, but on a different vibration level. So when we talk about the north of the conscious mind, we're talking about the higher levels of consciousness, the reality of the subconscious mind. And so that's where it gets complex, you see. So we've instantly turned the cross into this multi-complex symbolic form that we can apply to everything, just like we can apply the yin-yang. And when we're looking at the human body, another very important context, which is not well known in, in the West, this is something I've tried to teach and pinpoint, and we're going to apply it to more Eastern philosophy, is the um, martial art or system of uh, splashing hands or sand shell. Because this is extremely important, and it's actually an Indian-based system which moved over um, to the the Chinese side of things much later in history and kind of start to be um, martial art revolution around the time of the Shaolin Temple. But we're not going to go into that right now. But the system itself is extremely important because the system is a martial art system, so it's fighting style. But it describes the human body as a cross, or more importantly, a box with a cross within it. And when you practice splashing hands, you stand upon cross and your center point also known as the golden rod which comes from the head down into the lower dantian into the hewing point into the ground between the legs your center of gravity lines up with the central point of the cross and therefore you can then move forwards and backwards left and right along this cross axis and it powers the physical movements of the body to generate power according to gravity but what we don't tell you in splashing hands quite commonly is that this cross obviously then follows you wherever you go. It's not just because you move off the cross doesn't mean the cross doesn't come with you. You are the cross is kind of above and below you, this construct of um, three-dimensional space. But when you're attacking an opponent, they also have a box. So these two boxes interact with each other. But when we look at the box, what you're also not told is that when you're attacking an opponent, this um, box isn't just on the floor above the movement, it's actually placed on a um, vertical axis in front. So when you're looking forwards, the crosshairs that you're looking at is also a cross with a box because it applies to the front, back, sides of any human body, be it your opponent or yourself. So when you're attacking forwards in a straight line, you're hitting down the centre of the cross. When you perform an uppercut, you're hitting up the central line. When you're doing a downwards attack, like an elbow, for example, you're hitting down the central point. When you do a hook or a back fist, you're hitting on a horizontal line across the cross. And so you're working a both on yourself and your opponent this, um, this cross or box uh, shape in front of you also. Um, and that's how it works, because you're mimicking the body's functionality or, or movements in relation to this cross, both in front and below, creating this physical space like we talked about at the beginning of the video. And so what it's teaching you is that all things, even as something as complex as a constantly moving human form, have to apply to this three-dimensional space with a box and a cross. And so for all physical things apply equally. So it's a philosophy, not just a fighting style, because you can apply that to anything in life. That's the point. It's a physical symbol, a construct. And when we look at, for example, the Kabbalah, the fourth point opposition of the Sephiroth is a representation of all physical reality in space because it represents the number four, the four points for fourth space. And so... 
on the, the Kabbalah, when we look at the Kabbalah, that's what it represents. Anything to do with the physical form is the space of number four. And so we have an east and a western tie. Again, if we look at the construct of the universe and the physical plane, we have an east and a west. And equally, we have these concepts in the north and the south as well. So we have four points of an example of four because everything in the physical reality relates to one another. So anytime you see the number four or the cross, we're talking about the physical body, the physical construct, the world, the kingdom. And when we look at Christianity again, so we look at the, effectively Jesus on the cross, and that is a representation of a man on the cross because his head is at the north, his feet are at the south, and his arms are at the east and the west. And that's what the story is meant to tell you. And yes, maybe he did hang on an actual physical cross, but it wasn't the same cross because it didn't have a top section um, because that wasn't used in the crucifixion, but it doesn't matter. The teaching is that the cross represents the body of Christ, which is all human beings, the kingdom and the world around us. It's a analogy, a metaphor to describe that all things in the world are based on the teachings of the cross. So that's what it is, that's how it works, that's what it's always meant to be. And so that message is often lost, um, but that's what it represents. It's the physical world, the physical kingdom around us, but all matter and the universe itself is built upon the four points that manifest into the physical reality we know today. And that's what it really works as. And again, that can be applied to buildings because we look at, for example, a church that is built in the shape of a cross because, or even a square, any given, it depends on the size and the shape of the church, obviously, but they're all basically a scaled up or scaled down version of the cross, be it one room or a cross shape with two naves and, and the upper context. But it's a scaled up version of the human body and the same concepts apply so for example the highest spiritual work happens in the headspace of the church which is where the um, head is of the human body the north side obviously it faces east to west but that's a different story but we call it the north because we're not looking at relation on the space we're looking at the actual uh, as you enter the building the higher part we consider is north and south I know it faces east and west, but again, that's a deeper story. I'm not going to go into it at this point. Um, but yeah, and then you have the uh, the different sides of, of um, the church that relate to different um, practices within it. But the solar plexus lies within the center, which drives the, um, the movement of the body. Um, and so we scale up uh, into, again, let's say the context of the universe where... We have the north, east, south, the planets, and we call them the kingdoms. So we have the northern kingdom, which is all to do with the Nordic side of things. We have the southern kingdom, which is all to do with kind of the African side uh, below the equator. And then we have the east and the west, which is to do with obviously the eastern side of things, which is Europe, and the um, oh, sorry, the western side of things, which is Europe, and the eastern side of things, which is um, kind of obviously India and China. I know we have the American side, but that's a little bit different also. Um, when we look at constructs and um, architecture, all buildings have to adhere to the um, physical construct also. So when we look, for example, the pyramids, the pyramids represent four corners. So the base is a square. So that represents the four pillars of the physical reality. Um, and again, when we look at energies and the basic form of energy, it's the connection to the physical world. So um, air, earth, fire, and water. But when we look at the occultism, that actually gets used within the idea of um, the four pillars, which can also be described as the ox, the man, um, the eagle, and um, I forget the fourth one, ox, man, eagle, and lion. Um, and those four represent again, obviously, the the, the four kingdoms of um, reality, which is a very west um, eastern concept. Again, was we described with the idea of the phoenix, the man, the tiger, and the dragon. Exactly the same thing, just different names describing. Uh, so, let's just take for a second then the actual use of the idea of the square and the cross, which can be applied to, for example, a ritual of the Kabbalah cross or the Kabbalistic cross 
Now this is very important because it's so widely used in the occultism scene and it's always it's very controversial to the Christian cross but actually that's where it comes from because we've forgotten the true meaning of the Christian cross but we often think that it's two separate things but as we've already then just described the Christian cross represents the kingdom which is what the Kabbalistic cross ritual seeks to represent and we know that the Kabbalistic cross ritual was used in ancient Egypt well before the use of the Christian cross um, and even the shaman kind of tribes use it as well to represent the physical body and the link between the physical body and the physical world and so we start kind of tying in more recent uses um, or concepts with the ancient ones as well but when we do the Kabbalistic cross, it's most commonly, there's different ways of practicing it. And the most common way is um, trying to draw in the four directions of the universe. So we draw in light from above um, and then from uh, we push it down below to make a central pillar. And then we um, obviously expand it out to the left and the right. And what we're taught is when we do that ritual, I'm not going to go to the ritual in this video, but I'm just going to briefly... Um, kind of expand upon it so we're making a cross within the human body which instantly ties in with a cross on the universal scale because the line is to extend from the heavens at the north down into the ground for our body so we're tying ourselves into the physical space um, but also we're kind of symbolically saying well we are also part of the um, the greater world around us and when you do this cross ritual you're meant to ex mentally expand your own physical form to become larger than the planet because you your body is expanding in the same way the physical space does to represent all the cosmic levels your own body becomes the earth it becomes the universe around us the space the solar system and so on and so your north becomes the north of all these different levels expanding out into the solar system which is fine however when we're expanding outwards we often forget that we need to contract back down so what happens on the kind of universal level also happens within our own physical bodies and we apply that with us all the time when we move and we live our lives and so we have to obviously what what gets forgotten about in these rituals especially the Kabbalistic cross is that there's a two-way action we can expand and we can contract we often get too caught up in trying to explore the universe and become one with the universe and so just very much like the pentagram ritual we're always trying to become more than we are we're trying to expand our mind outwards and so we're trying to with the pentagram ritual we're trying to become one with the energies of the universe and expand out which is fine and the same here with the cross we're trying to become the larger universe but we have to remember that we cannot still escape our physical form at some level, no matter how phys um, spiritually advanced you are. Until you die, you are still anchored to this physical plane. And so we have to make the most of that. And what we're doing is we can expand our knowledge outwards by expanding this cross and expanding our mind into the universe and growing into the cosmic levels. But we must at some point bring all that information back, that energy back and pull it back down and contract it and compress it down into a singular point uh, within the human body which is the solar plexus the central point of the cross so we're pulling every concept of the um, macrocosmic um, north as it is the heavens the solar system the heart the sky the, the, the mind all of it down into the solar plexus but we're also pulling up the earth, everything from the south, the earth, the, um, uh, all the legs, the gravity, everything up into the solar plexus, everything off to the right and everything off to the left. And we're pulling it all down and we're squeezing it and compacting it down into one singular micro um, pinpoint or space within the solar plexus. And we're pulling energy in, we're becoming, we're taking the universe and making it us because we are the universe on the tiny level microscopic level 
Um, and we need to apply that force into our daily lives as we go around. So we're interacting with the physical world around us. That's an inevitability. Whenever we touch anything, we're interacting physically. So we're applying the rules of physics. We're using body mechanics to apply force around us to create and change the world. That's manifestation. And so that's what martial arts are, especially that example with... Um, I mean, all martial arts have to adhere to the rules of physics, but certain internal styles, such as splashy hands, shingi, chen tai chi, bagua, these systems are the idea of trying to make those balances and harmonies interact, so you become a conduit between the physical flows of reality within the body, and that's what all the physical martial arts systems are meant to be. They're manifestations of the physical reality, the use of the cross, um, and so then being able to manipulate and create the world around us. Now, technically, a martial art is also things like um, gymnastics or um, architecture, because when we are creating buildings, we are manipulating the physical world around us in line with the mechanics and flow of force in the world around us. We cannot escape that. But we're applying the worldly universal knowledge then bringing it back down into our own bodies and then applying it so crafting art such as masonry and joinery carpentry which is all part of the christian story which you know jesus was a carpenter blah blah blah, blah. so <laughs> i won't go over that too much but then we have freemason which is obviously we're crafting the masons and it's the same story again and again and again it's taking the lessons of the universe, contracting them down into a physical art and manifesting them into reality. We can't always be chasing the higher realms, we have to come back sometimes to create a better world around us, which is what a lot of occultists don't bother doing anymore. They're all about intellectual side, it's a study of this and study of that and higher realms of this and, and when we look at spirituality in modern days, people practicing yoga and self self-awareness and mindfulness and doing your chakras all this business we're too focused about escaping reality but we have to take the lessons we learn when we've done that and bring that back so we can create a better world around us and that's why the physical world we live in today is becoming stagnant it's becoming degraded because the people in it are even not learning higher level material and applying it back to the world around us all the people that are learning this higher level stuff aren't applying it also so we have a division we have people who are affecting the world but don't have any spiritual development we have people with spiritual de development but aren't affecting the world and we need to meet in the middle to benefit human society to create a better world around us and so that's what the use of the number four is and when we look at things such as the you know, I took a trip to edinburgh recently and part of that is there's a guild up in um I think it's sterling on top of the hill where there's a little hall and it's all to do with the guild masters the masons the crafters all this sort of thing and there's a symbol that they all wear on the tunics very much like freemasonry but it's a reverse number four and that represents the shared vision that all these people are trying to build a better reality around them a better um, city by delving into the higher mysteries of whatever guild it is they're doing and bringing it back to um, the physical reality in a um, unified way so we have these meetings to kind of establish the best route to create changes within society and that's what the reverse number four really means it's the ability to create the physical space or improve the physical space based on the teachings of spirituality gained from other practices and that's extremely important it's also why for example the templar cross is so important again another controversial topic for those in the occultism the, the, the templar cross is the same thing the rosy cross is the same thing red cross the red represents the spirit or the passion or the energy which is why number five is considered red the pentagram because it's all to do with blood spirit and energy whereas the cross is the physical reality the energy is 
and the harness within its container therefore the cross is red but the shape is the cross because the cross represents the kingdom which is the kingdom that Templars with a sword and shield to protect the sword being the defense the shield being the um, active form of change the separation just like um, you know it, it's the whip and the rod of the um, the pharaohs same thing they were the protectors and the defenders of the kingdom two tools for use in opposite directions to affect the cross and they wore the cross in their tunics because their body was also in a kingdom which they practiced the same things on and then applied outside because remember they were warrior monks the, these are the true concepts it's, it gets too misconstrued on this politics of good and evil and or were they satan worshippers or this that and the other and it's not important that's all extra fluff that kind of clouds the judgment of these things it's the practices they use were taken from times before and applied to their lives and that's all that really matters and we need to learn from that and so things like for example the um when we have the time of the Renaissance, uh, where we have the guilds, the guild of the, um, oh, bear with me, the mirror, the guild of the mirror, uh, where um, all the different guilds were exactly the same as what I've just described before. There were different ways of manifesting spiritual practices into physical reality to better improve the community they were in, to create art, to create doors, to create um, s sculptures and um, specifically the, the mirrors were uh, it was a symbolic context to describe this as something in one of my books that you'll have to look at later because it's just too complex to put into this video um, and the Medici were the ones that organised that but all the guilds were ways of manifesting spiritual practices into reality um, and creating art and expressionism that kind of thing and that was very key teaching which is why um, that is such an important part but then we look at the um, Huguenots because that culture that moved into um, kind of um, the, the Huguenot area of, of Spain where um, the Huguenots then went on to create things such as um, um, the Fabergé eggs they were great crafters because they believed in crafting and when they migrated uh, through kind of um, again a more Christian um, Catholic kind of war period they were expelled and exiled and they moved to um, Ireland and uh, England on the shores of Kent and they were all great crafters because they created shoes um, they created um, jewelry uh, they, they, they became the crafters of um, architecture and um, they designed cities in America and they crafted things like fine leather um, garments for the upper class, um, like uh, bags and, and, and stuff like that. Because the crafting was always important, you were always told to apply the spiritual practices into the physical reality. And that's something that's continued on. So usually people who are great crafters in history were often great spiritualists also because they understood that it went hand in hand with one another so that's where we're going to end it today there's quite a lot of information there but there's also a lot more we haven't discussed um but they're just kind of um, snippets of how it's been embedded into our culture and what the true use of the cross or the four points or the square or the cube is for both occultism and the ritual artistic um, practices of modern day kind of spiritualism but also how it's been applied in the past and all the way back to shamans and what its true meaning was and we've even discussed in mathematics the very core of the universe how it actually represents um, the same thing so we've looked at it at all different levels in uh, science and spirituality in religion in culture in martial arts um, in architecture and all community and economics so it's it's consistent throughout and that's why symbolism is so important because when we look at something as simple as a square or a cross how deeply do you really look at it and they, these are the things we need to look at and understand because if we understand that everything around us is linked together and there's more to it there's more depth then we can look to understand the universe and make it better with what we find within it 
So I hope you've enjoyed. Please leave a comment. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you do want to learn a lot more about this, if we, if you, I have got a book on this particular subject called Our Sacred Space, which represents um, the symbolic use of all physical space, both in the mind and obviously in physical reality as well, and how it shapes our conscious and subconscious minds. Um, but also uh, the book about Our Sacred Knowledge, which rep- which goes through these concepts of the the different shapes and the points and how they're used in different areas of the world more deeply. So do check those out. Um, And obviously they're available on ebook or softback.